Hello and welcome to another episode of The Podcast, a cannabis podcast for budding enthusiasts. As always, you're joined by your boy, Heavy Days, here from the Upside Down Library. And as usual, we want to give a massive shout out to all of our incredible sponsors who help ensure the show continues to happen. CT now, number one seed bank in the industry, all the hottest breeders, the latest drops, everything you can look for and more. Whether you're after indoor, outdoor, feminized, regular, auto flower, they've got everything under the sun to keep you loaded on all the hottest genetics, producing the most fire bud you've ever had. I hear they've got some incredible lines from Heavy Days still in stock. If you want to go check that out, make sure to do it before it's too late. Big shout out to CT now. We appreciate you so much. Likewise, if you want to produce the best bud to date, you've got to make sure your garden is pumping on all cylinders. And for that, we recommend our good friends at Organics Alive. They produce the number one powdered organic products that will ensure your next crop is the absolute best to date. People are picking up cups all around the globe using their products, which is the highest accolade you can get. Home growers just like you producing not only their best harvest to date, but award-winning harvest. What more could you ask for? They've got solutions, whether you're in veg, transition, flower. They've got micronutrients, macronutrients, absolutely every product you could want, ferments and more. Check them out, guys. Organics Alive, your number one stop for all of the highest quality organic inputs to make sure your harvest is killing Likewise, you've got to make sure your garden is pest and pathogen free to ensure that your plants are happy and producing the highest quality harvest. For that, we recommend you check out our good buddies at Copit. They've partnered with us for a long time and we have no doubt that if you use their products, you will find they are the absolute best in the game. You've got to check out the Spidex Vital Plus Breeder Sachets. These are an absolute game changer. It's the usual Spidex Vital you know and love that's going to take out any spider mite problems you have. But the Breeder Sachets allow a continuous, sustained release of these beneficial predators into your garden, ensuring that you don't just have one big burst and surge, but instead a consistent rate of release. Truly a game changer. I expect nothing less from the experts at Copet Biological. You know these guys are world leaders. They're not just in America, they're all around the world and for good reason. They are the pinnacle of the game. If you're after biological pest control, check out Copet. Number one, thank you so much for the support. The final piece of the puzzle to ensure that your room is killing it is our good friends at Pulse. Their sensors are second to none. Industry leading and just recently they announced the Pulse Hub. What more could you want? An integrated unit for all of your sensors to ensure that your garden is automated and tracking all of the variables you may not be consciously aware of. From VPD to PPF, dew point, temperature, humidity, so much more. You've got to get yourself a Pulse sensor guys. It has revolutionized the way I grow flower and increased the terpene content, the cannabinoid content, the yield, so, so, so much more. Shout out, as always, to our friends at Pulse Sensors. Likewise, if any of you guys have been listening to the show, you know that I am passionate about helping people transition to vaporized options if they're considerate about their respiratory health. And for me, Dynavap are the world leaders in this. Dynavap helped me to transition from bongs to vaping. And I tell you what, I've never looked back. Their unit is the most potent, the most highly replicating of a bong hit I've ever come across. And through their incredible M unit, I was able to successfully get off bongs a few years ago now. Truly one of the most innovative and interesting vapes on the market using a totally different design to others you've found. Please check out Dynavap. I promise you guys, if you've tried vaping before and felt like it didn't quite cut it, check these guys out. You will not be disappointed. Massive shout out to Dynavap. Thank you so much. And last but not least, we want to give a massive shout out to the incredible Patreon gang. Without you guys, we could not continue to make episodes. If you want to get early access to upcoming episodes, exclusive content just on the Patreon, including the likes of Mean Gene, Bob Hemphill, Bodhi, Trichome Jungle, so much more, be sure to go check out our Patreon. We give away genetics every month to our supporters, along with artwork, vapes, sensors, so much more. Please check out the Patreon, guys. I promise you, you won't regret it. You'll get your money back in swag for helping support a show you love. Thank you so much to everyone from the Patreon. We appreciate you so greatly. And on today, we have part two with one of the last remaining titans in the cannabis scene, the creator of Mr. Nice Seed Bank, 
the upcoming Shanti Baba Seeds about to hit the World Wide Web near you, as well as an absolute kick-ass Aussie breeder. A massive welcome to none other, Shanti Baba. Here to chat all things genetics, history, medical cannabis and predictions for the future, preservation, and so, so, so much more. So without further delay... Alrighty gang, we're back for another one and on this one today, we're welcoming back an absolute titan of the cannabis scene, one of the last remaining godfathers of modern genetics. You know him, you love him. A big shout out and thank you to Shanti Barber of Mr. Nice Seed Bank for taking the time to join us again today. Thank you. Didn't realize he'd be back so quickly, but it's lovely to be back. Uh, Much appreciated that you took the time to come join us again today. Same question we started off with last time. What have you been smoking on recently? Oh, well, today, um, it's a bit early because it's only morning time, my time, but uh, I did get up in the middle of the night and had a puff on, um, I think it was pink lemonade. It was uh, a little variety that we've uh, we've been growing for some years now and um, it's just, uh, yeah, it's a good, good, good feeling thing. It's not too strong, not too weak, lovely flavour, just a good effect back to bed and had a few hours extra sleep. <laughs> That's beautiful to hear. I, I can envision myself doing a similar thing, that little nightcap to help get you back there. I'd, I'd love to just follow that up and ask, are there any particular things that are like daily drivers for you that like, you know, you're sort of regularly reaching for? What are the things in your toolkit? You know, um, I was thinking about that the other day. Um, I, I I don't really have a kind of, I mean, I, I wake up and I feel different every day. And so I, I like to have a big variety from different hashes that I've made, even Moroccan and, and Charis sometimes, and, and then three or four different marijuanas are, are always available. So I, I can choose because some morning I wake up and I just want to numb myself and other morning I wake up and I'm bubbly and I um. I just take one or two puffs of, uh, you know, a, a mango haze joint and I'm, I'm fine for hours. So it's really, I suppose, it's to do with the chemistry going on in your body and how you slept and things like what's on your mind. But, yeah, I like to keep, you know, solids and and, and greenery uh, available, two or three of each thing. So uh, And mix it up. I mean, I mix up stuff all the time. I'm not one of these purists when it comes to, you know, sort of, I, I suppose I, I'm purist in the fact of um, I try everything a lot, but when I choose to just do a uh, myself, just the recreational smoke, or um, then it changes, you know. But I, uh, lately, I suppose I, I, I've been towards the the solids, the hashes that we make, you know, ourselves out of single strains, and, and they're always very interesting when you try a single strain of hash like rather than the grass i think we talked about this last time a little bit about making some different blends and stuff but yeah it's really different when you you try um the hash version of that particular grass you get a a few more different effects yeah certainly we had a, a lot of listeners who were really thrilled with the sort of discussion you gave last episode as a little follow-up i'd be curious to ask do you find that there are any particular sativa strains that translate in effect nicely into the concentrates because i think you often hear people saying oh a lot of the times it it just feels sort of like hybrid slash indicree you lose that uplifting euphoric sort of effect are there any strains that come to mind for you where like you think it does translate over nicely well i've made um um hashes from obviously um i think afghan haze is a really good uh, uh, an incredible strain first of all as a, as a marijuana one of the building blocks of the industry from from our breeding point both neville and i um, um over the years and uh, it, it's uh, actually a, if you grow it well and um you you grow enough of it you can make some really good hash from it but maybe you you don't make 10 to 12 percent like on a on a dry you know sort of on yield from uh, whether you do it ice or dry or, or whichever way. But you could definitely get, you know, sort of 7 8% out of some of these 
Hayes hybrids, and they're very different. They're really, um, yeah. It's, I always try to describe them a little bit more like the 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 effervescent part of uh, uh, like the champagnes of the industry. It, it's kind of you don't always feel stoned, but you're cerebrally high, you know, and and. So um, I kind of like that when you go out to a party uplifted and you're a bit euphoric and kind of can hear music really well and you, you know, rather than your body's tired and you want to sort of slap on the couch and watch a film and they're, they're very different effects. And so I, I suppose um, Neville's Haze, we made, um, we were lucky enough to grow quite a lot of it at one stage outside. And like I said to you, I mean, I like outdoor plants for making hash. I think they actually, the resin is much more rounded and, and a bit like wine or, or, or olives, you know, um, something to do with the environment and that year and the sun and aspect and the water and all of the chemicals in the soil. And, you know, it's just something different. And um, and so, and the turpins, uh, I always find the turpins are much stronger and they last longer from an outdoor variety rather than indoor because indoor, you open it, you get a, a, a flush of, uh, of, of turpin and then it sort of dies down very quickly. Whereas a good growing outdoor, you open up the, the jar and the room remains fragrant, you know, and it, it stays that like that. So, We'll probably find out in a few years that outdoor um, has a better integrity of uh, um, on the turp and, and the flavonoids and different compounds on the plant rather than indoor and greenhouse sort of, you know, controlling the climate and then giving you the potentially the best yields of cannabinoids and stuff like that. So I think a combination of both is always good. That's why I blend, you know, it's like what I explained last time, blending a bit of the dry with the ice and uh, kind of making the flavours, the full integrity of the plant. So, and, and you know, many times uh, I've, I've uh, the hash, like what I was explaining before, when you do a single strain and you make a, a, a sieve from it, a dry sieve from it, for example, there's something different about the hash version than the plant version because you probably got some very small amounts of a certain cannabinoid that you have a minute amount in a plant, but you never really get the effect of it. But in a hash, you've got a higher concentration of that and it, it, it fits into the recipe of that plant. So that's why I always say the hash version of a single strain uh, field is very, it, it allows you to understand exactly the medicine of that plant properly. Whereas the plant, it maybe has a completely different feeling sometimes and, and the chlorophyll changes that effect as well. So, you know, I do think they're really important to to study them as two different kind of um, medicines in a way, you know. Yeah, wow, that, that's really interesting. And I guess with what you've just said, as a follow-up, do you specifically breed with the intention of plants performing well outdoors? And is that where you sort of see the global production of cannabis heading in the future? Well, <sighs> I mean, outdoors is is obviously the cheapest, and and um, if you have a good season, it, it's it's the most abundant, uh, cheapest uh, um, yielding kind of crop you can have. Um, indoor, everything has to be climate controlled, and there's an expense, and there's you know, staff, and a lot of electricity, and and a lot of expenses related to. Uh, an established uh, greenhouse or, or an indoor facility, you know. Um, outdoor, uh, you don't always hit it on the head with the, the environment for that year and the climate maybe affects it in a negative way. But when it hits it in a positive way, I, I do believe you've got um, a huge amount of yield compared to what you could produce um, in inside or in a greenhouse, you know. And uh, so there's a lot more scope with uh, cheaper production lines. I mean, making hash outdoor for me would be a very sensible um, way, a sensible kind of a decision. Um, and and using aspects of indoor greenhouse to blend with it, that that may be that would come into it, you know, but um, like Australia doesn't really have, haven't had a hash culture, for example. I mean, only pockets of it where people making their own extracts now in the last sort of 10, 15 years. But 
some of the extreme boys have been making a, a little bit of sip, but you'd have to know them to 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 actually experience that in Australia. Uh, whereas Europe had had eighty percent of their market had always been solids, uh, uh, you know, for up until twenty thirty years ago when marijuana started to to kind of come in and become interesting and, and different, and they see them as different things rather than just marijuana or wheat. You know what I mean? So yeah, it's been an evolution, and and it still is. It's still evolving because not everybody knows everything about you know. Um, strains or, or or what do they do to people or, or how the effect is. Uh, and, you know, you sometimes year to year they, they vary outdoor and they don't have the same effect. They smell the same, they look the same and there's something missing, you know. So I, I suppose, excuse me, I suppose it's the same with wine and, and you know, like this year, unfortunately, a lot of people in Liguria, in Italy, they didn't pick the olives. It wasn't worth it. There was, uh, they got hit during the season with some uh, hails and it got a lot of damage and it was just not economic. And, uh, and you know, um, uh, uh, there's a few areas that, that, that it wasn't practical and it wasn't, there was no value in picking the olives. So this year will be a particularly uh, average year, you know, for production. And um, that that happens outside because you can't control, obviously, the, the weather. So, I mean, with that point in mind, I guess, do you think that the base sort of commodity of medical cannabis in the future might be some sort of highly processed product as opposed to flour because of that inherent variation from season to season you reference? Like, you know, will there eventually be like a Jack Daniels number seven equivalent of concentrate? Um. You know, I've tossed, uh, we, we talked about this many times when we were riding high, I suppose, uh, um, Howard and Neville and myself and a few other guys. We always talked about having the uh, can, uh, Connoisseurs Club, you know, where we've we've kept different years of hash and we've vacuum sealed them and kept them in a cellar like we do wine, you know, and we... We had a, a bud, but the buds fade because they they yellow out and they the chlorophyll deteriorates. So when you make an extraction, they don't fade so quickly. You know, maybe some of the cannabinoids change to more sleepier cannabinoids over time and stuff. But if you hold them well, um, and I've got a friend who's who's made he's got a sample of every single piece of hash he came across or made from the early 90s onwards, and it's like a coffee. It could be a coffee table. I mean, it was really, this is really impressive. Wow. Um, and you really see the difference and the evolution you see, um, and we've become very good at making hashes and stuff. But for me, early days, when I didn't, when we were really tossing around, we made a lot of uh, plants uh, in, the, in 1998, 99 in, in Switzerland when I first came here. Um, I used to gather the... Uh, the what fell off the plants um, they, they used to just cut the um the flowers off the wood over the silk screens and in the end of the day i would just go there myself and, and get it all because they were different plants done different day so i was able to gather say skunk one only hash or super silver hash or early queen hash or you know and we kept it and and um we were able to press it up and and clean it up over time. And and I used that as the original, um, I used to melt it with um, olive oil and give that as, as drops to uh, patients right at the beginning of everything. And and for me, that was the bet that I've always used that. And then ice, then we started with the water ash and that was actually real base of medicine. So yes, I believe that, uh, at the moment, unfortunately, the pharmaceutical industry is so uh, overregulated and, and corrupt that, that I think that the um, the only way that the people will take it back eventually, the, the hash makers or the um, like the wine makers, um, they will be growing little small areas of particular sort of strains that only grow in those areas, for example, uh, really well. And uh, they'll be making their kind of 200 kilos of uh, cottage industry style stuff. And that maybe is bought by a, a particular pharmaceutical who uses it to make their base product uh, is one of the base products that they blend, you know, and 
those, those specific uh, sort of um, kind of unique recipes will will start with like companies that that will only demand high quality and have found a plant that's actually working for a particular ailment you know and and they see that it's useful and we'll start to specialize down those lines even more you'll start getting pockets of of, of people who have worked on particular plants for certain ailments you know and uh, or maybe the, the turpin and the cannabinoid blend of uh, you know a particular master push for example does something really well for depressive people and and when you make the extraction that particular stuff works every time you know and so obviously then we can start to say this is much better for that problem you know at the moment it's um, a bit of a stab in the dark i'm afraid even the best doctors and and the best growers they can't really predict you know what what is happening or they can't prove it with science why that plant is better for you if you're suffering from parkinson's or or a food disorder or you know what i mean it, it's very difficult we're at that that level at the moment of trying to work it out and so a lot of scientific research is going into a very small incremental facets of this industry at the moment you know wow and and do you think like long term i'm talking many years eventually we'll get to the point where you'll have a certain cannabis, you know, product, extract, whatever form it is that's for X, Y, Z and it slots in with all your other pharma tablets. And as a quick follow-up, how do you think we can help get the acceptance we need from healthcare workers? Because I know that around the world there's still a lot of people in healthcare who are still very dismissive and not particularly interested in medical cannabis. You know, um, that's a difficult one because... Changing the mentality, you saw how slowly the world changed from marijuana being a drug because of all the negative propaganda for many, many, many decades uh, to it becoming a medicine and being treated with a, a lot more respect. Still has a stigma attached in certain areas and there's still old people who don't, you know, would t- put a pill in their mouth any day of fentanyl, but they, they would question you know, someone smoking a vaporizer uh, is using drugs. And uh, so mindset is a really important. Education is super important. And uh, and actually um, allowing people to decide with a, a better consultation from maybe an agency or, or independent agency that is not profiting from giving out any particular advice but helping the patient before they see the doctor so they have a kind of understanding uh, of what they're looking for when they they describe their symptoms doctors aren't always the people who prescribe um, the best drugs for people because sometimes they're earning um, they have sponsorship from certain companies and i think that that kind of you know sort of um, tints the water Um, so I, i would prefer to see um a, a, a much more neutral um, um committee set up to it help people get knowledge about what things do to them and you know um and and how they could be uh, looking for the best particular things that that some people need a, a pill they don't smoke because they've got you know particular uh, the, uh, sickness and and smoking is revolting uh, I, I personally believe no sick person wants to smoke, inhale anything. I think they would prefer to take a pill, a capsule, or a, a slug of oil. And so for me, um, I believe that's the real medical um, um, that's the real medical fraternity that I look at when I'm looking at those and not the, say that the people who have um, have, have sort of jumped on the bandwagon as medical, but they're using it as recreational. I, I don't think there should be a, discre- a, 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 a difference, to tell you the truth, between medical and recreational thing. I think people should be allowed to use most everything as long as they don't abuse these things. And that means that you, you've you got to put it in an independent sort of committee that, that sets some rules that are, are not tainted by big companies and, and by individual producers. You know, you don't want them to to 
to sort of push certain things, but you need education. It's a difficult question. Look, I'm sorry to put it to you, my friend, but I knew you were up to the challenge. So Yeah, I mean, I'm looking at it all the time at the moment. Um, and and because, well, I, I mean, I'm working in the medical now where I work in the medical because we have the licenses and, and it makes uh, uh, the legal side of it much better now. We have, have farms that we can go to and, and hold our head up high and we, we can work with certain strains now. And and so I, I believe a lot of the people at, uh, who I'm working with in Switzerland don't come from my industry whatsoever. They come from a very um, educated uh, um, sort of protocol of a pharmaceutical industry where they they realise that uh, um, some things have been pushed on public are not really helping and they've actually changed their way and they want to get a, a natural, something natural that they see the next uh, level of understanding for a lot of people and the least harmful and least, uh, um, you know, symptomatic uh, post-symptomatic problems that you have with taking certain drugs. So, you know, that's half the time. I mean, I, I don't like to take a pill. I really have to be desperate to take a pill of anything. But when I know that I've made this capsule with just 6% CBD and, and 40 turpins, uh, I'm, I'm, in, I'm on for an extra better carafenol uh, turpin to enhance the CBD. I know those things work for for me at the moment, but it's just trial and error. I mean, this is going to take a while to be very confident to know, right, this is my opinion or this is science. You know what I mean? <laughs> at the moment, it's my opinion based on a little bit of home science, you know? Certainly. Look, I mean, we had our intuitions about the medical values early on. I'm, I'm sure as time goes by and we discover more, we'll – learn more that probably backs lots of the things we suspected but uh i wanted to quickly change the topic because that, that was the reason why i asked you some of the hard medical questions i knew you were into it but i wanted to ask the day after we did our last chat you put a post up talking about how you have a new skunk line coming out and appropriately it's called new skunk <laughs> can you tell us a little bit about the backstory on this one and yeah. what inspired you to do this project now well I, i've been busting open a lot of old seed uh, from my my um my fridges and a lot of old stuff from Nell's and some of it has been germinating it's too a bit too old and some of it we're we're doing different techniques to get some old seed germinating and and I actually was uh, the new skunk was actually uh, um, a, a very old skunk seed it was a a, a skunk one um by uh, Skunk 187. It was one of Neville's very old thing, and I read the thing, and I got the mail out of it, and um, I hit it back to my uh, Skunk 1, which is the female, and I produced a very small batch of seed, and I, I, I then I put it out there. I got it tested by quite a lot of people on the website and stuff, and uh, um, I was trying to develop a, a, a good hash-making skunk. You know, actually, that was... That was the kind of project in mind, and uh, it just uh, and and it was different smells. There was there was definitely that old stink, um, you know. That really it was not pleasant. Sometimes it was a little bit, oof, you know, it was a little bit off putting. Um, Wafts over, and and I remember a lot of people used to love that uh, the effect of those, those flowers. So. I, I must have mentioned at one time that I was doing this on the website and, and then I got a line of people and they, they all started hassling me. So I sent out a batch of these old seeds. I don't have many. I, I only had a few and I gave them to my daughter to put through the auctions. Um, so we we kind of, excuse me, we, we kind of um, made test batches and we've, we, we've made a, a small batch, but it's still, I'm still playing with it. I mean, selecting... Um, there's a really wide variety in that selection of the progeny seed that I call new skunk at the moment. I would prefer to inbreed some of it back to the male and just keep selecting a female and putting it back to the male and until I really see a particular thing coming out. And I, I, uh, a few people have asked me for the stink. You know, they wanted to go back and they're trying to find that, that old, 
old world skunk. And I believe you can find it, but you're going to have to bust open a few seeds. And so I'm, I'm, I'm making some more seed at the moment just for a few guys who, who want to do like a thousand and they, they want to look for that. And so, uh, yeah, I, I don't say that, it, it, you know, you'll find it every time, but I, I'm trying to give the tools back to some people who are looking for specifically for certain things again. And I, I've definitely got the, the original and all of Neville and all of my old stuff and all of the old uh, stuff that we started all the strains from. In the free, uh, upstairs in, in the office, I have, you know, six or seven fridges just all. <laughs> it's a, I mean, I think I could. Oh wow! I could float a few countries with uh, with crops, but uh, you know, they're all at different levels. And I, you know, when if I don't have enough time, I, I kind of put the notes inside, vacuum seal it, and put it in the freezer. I know I'm going to come to it in a few years because you know, there's only so many so many seeds you can bust open, and so many projects you can do properly and and give your attention to it at one time. But um, I have a a, a a, a can of Bible, I call it. It's all my my notes, and and sometimes I have to really go back to that to realise what that particular batch of seed was. And I knew that it was a had an orange corner on it for a reason. And then I would find the orange corner, and then I'd go, oh yeah, that was really interesting batch. We need to look through that again with you know. So so I mean, you know, um, I help a lot of guys at the moment. I've sent a few batches of garlic bud to one guy in England and some old hash plant and if you find something you'd share it with me but you know these are old seeds from 30 40 years now um i'm never going to have enough time in my life to bust open everything that i've got treasured away and uh so it's it's that sort of time for certain people to uh trust them to 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 kind of help with some projects you know and and i i have a really good batch of um people on the forum and my moderator Mushashi he's a he's an excellent guy and he's a very good grower excellent photographer and so what happens is that he's an educator now for for these new up-and-coming guys who are, are really playing with their own varieties and adding some hazes in and then you know he, he's already done all these things and he comes from the pharmaceutical world which disgruntled pharmaceutical world and and he's retired now, so he's the perfect guy to – to. he's an educated, smart, wonderful, diplomatic person to have, better than me. In fact, I, I'm, I, I'm a bit short sometimes when I think people have asked the question 7,000 times and they should have read some of the literature, but uh, he's not like that. So, um, yeah, I, I really thank some of the crew around me. They, they've been exceptionally helpful. My daughter, my son, my son's. Everyone actually, they work really well. Wow, that's that's incredible. You know, many hands make light work, and and so many cool little tivids there we could chase down. I guess one of the things that stuck out to me, I'd love to hear. You said your female skunk cutting. What's that one like? Well, it's not actually mine. That was from Neville. I mean, it's the original skunk one that Neville had. Dave Watson and Rob Clark. They had it. Um, they were all playing at the same time. Neville found his particular, and he called it this, his skunk one. Uh, Dave Watson called his version skunk one. So you got to remember, skunk one was a skunk is a very confused term because there's arguments if there was certain things in it, and and of course, you know, Dave Dave Watson has his version, and, and that's everything is probably correct according to him there. Um, whereas, uh, um, you know, uh, Neville probably selected, uh, they prob they were working similarly at one stage when everyone was friendly until this green merchants, uh, you know, sort of problem that came in and exposed a few of the Americans and then, you know, things changed and that was all in Holland at that stage and, and they were all started to then separate their plants, you know, and Neville was... I think he was um, he, he was the real um, um, go getter and innovator uh, um, of of um, specific genetics um, at that time. Whereas the other guys were were, were there for reasons uh, I don't know, and they had licenses for reasons I'm not sure. And but I, I was friends with all of them, and I was using both sides, and and there were slight differences in their skunks. 
Um, I did like Rob Clark. There was a version that Rob Clark gave me once, and I made uh, some incredible hash from it. So, you know, they're all that. It, it it's like um, um, if I pick a haze or Neville picked a haze, we'd pick different hazes. Yeah, there were differences that we liked. And, um, you know, it would be the same with you. You, you could put 100 haze in the room and, and there might be 100 different versions and they're all called haze, you know. So um, I, I think keeping the original in, in, in um, as, as mothers and, and uh, living genetics um, has been probably the hardest job of, of my life and um, and always having four or five backups in different countries because you lose so many things. I mean, uh, you know, um, and now thank God for tissue culture, which is, is, is going to save us, uh, get rid of some of the viruses that are now, you know, the late, the late and hot virus and, and the mosaic virus and there's other viruses coming and, and you know, we, we really need to be aware of um, of a lot more things, you know, and old seed busting it open, there weren't many viruses, so I'm, I'm not really worried about the old seed coming in, but a lot of this new stuff, I'm just, I don't take it in my rooms. I don't take any plants from from anything that hasn't come from tissue culture, regrowing and plenty, you know, um, because I, I this, this, this virus goes around pretty quickly now, and it, it, it used to be, just talked about in America and a little bit in Canada, but I think it's around the world now. I mean, it's it's one of these things that maybe doesn't express itself uh, until the conditions go down, but uh, it's definitely um, it's spread now. You know, it's one of those things you just can't hold. Sorry. Yeah, hugely. Look, I'm going to have to loop back to several of the points there, especially the hoplaten virus and, you know, the just maintaining mothers over years. It's definitely some interesting topics. But I wanted to quickly ask you before we move on, yep. you mentioned Dave Watson, and I think in, in the grand scheme of things, he's considered one of the grandfathers of the whole industry in a sense. Um, but for a long time, he copped a lot of flack. Like a lot of people would accuse him of collaborating with that green merchant operation. And I think for the most part, people have realized that that wasn't the case and he's a good guy. I'd be interested to hear, what's your sort of thoughts on the overall roles Dave Watson slash Sam the Skunk Man has played in the scene? Any notable stories or encounters? You know, I don't make an opinion about things that I weren't around for and, and I, I, I'm only hearing from particular people. Um, I was working with Ariane and Neville at that stage. Neville was very much against Dave Watson and Rob and, and the other crew at that stage. I was friendly with them both. Uh, I had different dealings with them, all, everyone. I, I was not a guy to make my opinion unless I was asked and I was definitely um, more pure, purist about breeding at that time and i was a little bit more focused on that and they were both excellent sources from different things and as well as other guys in in holland um so um while i was meant to be probably um um on neville and 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 the greenhouse side at that stage uh, i kept an open mind and i did business with both sides and um i did prefer the diversity of seed breeding from Neville because, um, uh, uh, say, Dave, he, he wasn't, he, he was, uh, he, he's a wealth of knowledge. He's, he, I met him many times and we, we have a, a, a healthy um, respect for each other. Like Rob Clark's probably a better friend. I've seen him all over the world. Uh, and we were good mates and still are. And I just haven't been in Holland and seen them for many years. And uh, um, I don't have any negative feelings about all of that. What I wasn't around for the, that green merchant thing. I heard about it, was exposed uh, on the radio. One day I was working with Neville and Ariane in a, in a big greenhouse where, where we did our thing. And they had on Dutch radio, they had a big, uh, explanation about that period and and there was some merit to certain things i don't know what was provable or not my dutch wasn't so good then and um it didn't get better and it was a move to italy and, <laughs> and so um i i tried to 
not give my opinion about things that really I'm, I, I don't know. Um, and I always say proof is in the seed. That's why uh, I took the seed from what they said and, and where it came from. And I busted it open and I went through it. And so I didn't have to believe anyone. I believed me from what I was given. And sometimes it was a little bit of a goose chase and other times there were some gems in it. And um, and the guys that I respected, I worked with. And, um, and uh, the other guys, well, you know, um, there was a, there's, there's, there's been a lot of negative uh, press uh, about me. And I read stories that never, that never even happened. And, and, you know, they're, so, I mean, I don't know what to believe anymore. You know, I know what I did and, and I know what I have and I know who I did it with. Um, you can ask me questions about those things all, all day long. Um, and I would have a beer with all of them still to this day. So I, I, I'm not really that, uh, I'm not really that opinionated about those things because it really doesn't have anything to do with the subject that I'm working on. And uh, usually that's to do with breeding or selecting or, finding cannabinoid uh, specific plants and you know and and for me i still uh, use rob clark's book he used a lot of my black hashes and indian hashes for his uh, hashish book uh, photographed many times in in there and uh, uh we've we've collaborated in, in things that most people would never know um one day i suppose i'll, I'll explain oh. some other things but yeah you know the, yeah Ooh la la, I guess we'll all have to wait for that day. And you know what? You read my mind. I was going to say, you know, I was hooked on the story about the hash you made that uh, Rob gave you the seeds from last time we were chatting. And you mentioned him a few times. I guess it's a good time to ask, like, I think as as well as Rob's known for his, like, seminal literature, the book, I also feel like he's kind of a little bit of an unsung hero of the scene. You know, he sort of flies a bit under the radar What's your friendship with Rob been like over the years? And do you agree he's a bit of an unsung hero? Yeah, yeah. No, for me, Rob, uh, I still recommend his uh, original book, Marijuana Botany, as uh, the first book that most people should go. I think he's the only um, one of the – I believe he is a scientific uh, author. He, he, he runs around the world to all the places, not the cannabis cups, but to the places where – Ge genetics origin originate from where uh, thread and fiber is uh, originated from he's gone deep into that kind of side of things he's gone to the russian uh, areas and and ukraine areas and found strains and helped keep uh, preserve a lot of hemp varieties you know in seed form up in in the cold storage and uh, he's done a lot of uh, unsung uh, hero kind of work and and for me he's still a very uh, reliable um, um, source of um, incredible uh, um, intelligence when it comes to a, a practical uh, education and a, and a theor theoretical education of cannabis so for me um, I don't really read uh, uh, a lot of the other guys' books. So, I mean, I, I'm friendly with them all, but, you know, I don't think that they're – I think they're writing it from a different perspective, uh, whereas Rob has always written it from a scientific point of view with provable referenced um, articles, and and I like his books, and I think he's to the point. And so as far as that goes, yes, I think he's probably the best cannabis uh, writer um, around. You know, in 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 a um, when it comes to not having your ego or opinion um, involved in what you're writing, so you know, yeah, brilliant. What a what a testament. Highly regarded by all, but awesome to hear that you you have him in such high esteems. A little earlier, you mentioned that there's issues of over the years, like parents changing and stuff of of strains that are offered by certain companies. And I guess I'm interested in this from the point of view that. I know like one of the notable cases was like Simon of Serious Seeds mentioned that at a certain point, the parents of Callie Miss changed because one of the parents got lost. I guess it started getting me thinking like, what are some of the challenges in general of maintaining a, a library of stock over such a long period of time? There's got to be things that the average person isn't even thinking about when you're comparing it. And have you ever had any issues with like mixed up stock or parents accidentally being lost, things like that? Every single issue in the book I've had, I can tell you. The thing is, 
um, in the old days, when you found something like Medicine Man, like we know, or, or White Ryan, whatever it was, that we were, when you found that genetic and you actually had that genetic, you would have to cut it. You didn't want to share it because that was your new baby. You've been working on it for a while and it was your new baby. But you put it in rooms of people who were growing stuff for you so you had a backup, right, in two or three different places because many times you got busted and you lost the mother room or someone followed you home and they ripped you off or every story in the book has happened, uh, unfortunately, and I've lost uh, I've told you last time I had in four, five countries and I lost in four countries all my backups. I only had one left and I was in jail at that time when I came out. I, I mean, it was a incredible relief. But um, I know the same thing happened to Neville. I know the same things happened to every Simon. Uh, he recently had to redo all of his mothers because he got the viroid. Uh, I speak to him uh, uh, quite frequently. Um he buys pills for his father from my my company in Czech Republic, you know the CBD stuff. So um, uh, we're we're all I'm I'm pretty friendly with most of them, and and we're all um, we talk openly, and and uh, yes, we do all have problems, and yes, the the hardest part of the job has been, like I said, keeping mothers healthy, mothers safe, and the original genetic label properly in all different countries when you're not there. Um, there's no doubt that uh, we've lost plants during our lifetimes. Um, uh, Hayes A male, how uh, uh, Neville had lost, uh, died. Uh, G13 original had died. Uh, uh, he, he lost various plants. You know, um, um, I I also went through uh, uh, Hawaii Five O. I lost at one stage. Heavy duty fruity nut. Uh, I lost. Uh, I have it in seed. I have a lot of these in seed form. I have to go back. But the original genetic that I selected, which I made certain things from, we lost. But we have the same gene geno uh, um, uh, generation. So I can always find the genotype. But to find the turpin and the, all the other small differences that made that plant special. Uh, you know, uh, luckily, you know, genetics is based on genes. So, so you can recreate things similarly, but maybe not exactly, you know. And um, so I know Simon's got different, like me, he's got different generations in, 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 in cold storage. And, and you know, if you have to go back and, and you've got to bust open something and find uh, another uh, father or mother or, or nowadays it's just mainly selections, um, you know, and you can spray them and self them and do all that sort of stuff. But um, I, I still don't like to use feminized or auto flowering uh, in, in the, the breeding world because I, I still think true male and female uh, expresses something different. But that's just my personal thing. You know, there's a lot of guys proving me wrong. Um, but I don't know. I, I'm still purist when it comes to going back to finding the original parents of a particular strain. Like, Afghan and Hayes, for example, I the Afghan tea that made that up originally from Nev, he'd selected that and then crossed it with the Hayes C, you know, and the Hayes A, and then you got two different versions, and then we had to start with selection, and that took quite some time. It's not like the first one that pops out is the right one, you know. So, and then you keep that alive, and you know, and that's a established building block over thirty. 30, oh, well, older than my kids, so still the same, so, you know. Wow, that's impressive, just the, the longevity of its lifespan is incredible, and you mentioned the, the haze A dropping off, you you picked my ears, because I'd heard rumors, and I'll be honest, I kind of doubted it, but I figured, I'll ask you, why not? Have you heard anything about the haze C male still being alive? I have it, yeah, of course. Oh, look at that. I, I think I'm the only guy uh, with AC male. I mean, Neville gave it to me uh, along with uh, a pure haze and, and a few other things many years ago, plus all of his seed stuff. Um, how have I been making the seeds for the last 30 years in, in the Mr. Night? I mean, it's still, if you have a look, um, I have now selected a haze AC male, which is something from old seed that I took two years to to bring to the table but 
Um, yeah, most of everything. We don't have the haze. Any, I, I don't have it in living form. I only have it in in um, seed form, mixed up. Um, that's why, I, like in the mango haze, the difference between mango haze and super silver haze is that is the haze. Uh, I think it was uh, skunk haze A with uh, northern light haze C. Um, those two were the parents. Went eventually, they were selection and they were the parents that made the mango haze. Whereas the haze C skunk, the skunk haze C, and the non -non -non light haze C that made the super silver haze line. So that when they were parallel, we call it parallel cross. So they're all coming into eventually pedigree. If you put it on a map, you'd finally come to a pedigree line. Um, when everything had won their cups, uh, Neville used to. Uh, started like that when he won something he used that as a pedigree plant and then we only did pedigree breeding at one stage and uh, with the widows and all of that we kept that going in certain charts so yeah i mean there's a lot of um and there's a lot of things that people don't really understand as such like you know you sometimes when you select um an old seed say a northern light one of and northern light two and northern light five i've got old seed of that you will select a female and a male from that thing that have been working properly. So when you cross it back, you 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 can use a male version or a female version. They might be very slightly different, giving different things, but they're from the same genotype, and and that way you're keeping the the, the genes uh, consistent, and um, the expression maybe is different in the phenotype. So yeah, we. No, that's that's awesome to hear. Stoked to hear you've still got it. And, you know, you mentioned the super silver haze and the mango haze. And I'd been thinking about that in the last episode. You you made a comment that Neville had gone through like thousands of seeds to find the super silver haze and you'd managed to do it with just 250. And I guess I was wondering, do you attribute that sort of more to luck or do you think just the way you had bred the line differently to the way he had bred his allowed you to be like a bit more focused and you didn't need to pop as many because a bit more of the selection was done in the breeding? You know, it's a, <laughs> Daisy, it's a really hard thing. It, it, I mean, maybe I, I I should have done a thousand like Neville, but you know, I think I found something that I I could really work with, and that was uh, when I crossed it to see. Basically, what we do is we 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 put out a bunch of seed, let's say a hundred seed at a time, and you pick the best three females, the best three males. You do the combinations, you test those seeds. When you can easily test, uh, throw away a male that is not performing, you see that very quickly in the progeny test of seed. Um, if you don't do that, you've got no idea what you're selling, which a lot of companies don't do, and they have no idea what they're selling. They just say that's the combination. Now, um, your punters, eventually the guys who are uh, uh, buying the seed, um, they, they will expose you if you're not doing a good job. And if you're... If what you said is not coming up trumps, and I mean, um, to this day, it's like never left, what, 20 or 23 years ago from Europe. I mean, I can't keep, I can't have old seed batches in the fridges from, from uh, old AC. It just, I couldn't sell 20 year old seed, you know what I mean? I can sell two year old seed because it's still maturing at that stage in, inside, but, uh, Everything's kept in fridges. Everything uh, is vacuum sealed. It all has dates on it. Um, old seed I offer to uh, uh, certain growers who who are ready to put out a, a big lump, and maybe they get eighty percent germination rather than one hundred, and they still buy it at a, at a reduced rate. So we we kind of clear our stocks a lot of the time. Um, you know, it, it, I don't know how other people run their companies, but. You know, you've you've got to have backups in genetics in seed form as well as having selected um, real form mothers. I mean, there's no doubt that that's the hardest part of the job. A mother room and a clone room, for me, are the mothership. God, yeah, look, kudos to you. It, it just seems like an overwhelming task the more I think about it. 
after our last episode, we got a bunch of listeners who messaged and they said, I've never heard of this Dr. Gavorkian strain. This sounds so interesting. And, you know, everyone's really curious. I guess the, 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 the summary of the overall questions I got from people was, how come you think it didn't catch on quite as well as the sister lines of Mango Haze and Super Silver Haze? Um, quite easily can answer that. We lost the plant. We, um, it, it, it was a project, you know, you don't know that all these things are going to work. And so no one kept back up. We just made uh, uh, some mothers. We did a whole room of it. We used even the old mothers in the room. We had got compromised. We had to go down. I told you the story last time with my father. We had to go and chop it all up and load it in. There was not a living genetic left of Dr. Kevorkian. There was some seed that we'd made with that strain. And maybe one day, um, I know I've got it. Um, um, it's not the easiest plant. I remember it. If I smell it, it will just come straight back in my head. But um, there's a lot of work to do and there's a lot of weeks of flowering, of waiting and, you know, like, I don't know. I mean, they're big projects to to try to refine. I prefer to go into it um, and 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 bust open old seed and see what I find rather than try to try to control what I'm wanting to find. You know, I want to be more open about it. And sometimes there's some really unusual, like early queen, for example, is a very different smelling, unique genetic um, originating from some early pearl, early girl sort of stuff that was around and that that was it still has a very different flavor different smell and a different effect and i think a lot of the people the seed is incredibly small and dark and um it, it's a it's a real interesting kind of line and, and i kept it going because you know we we've made some early skunk versions we've made a lot of um plants that were, have been practical for growers with projects and limited seasons and and I busted a, a load of seed for those sort of guys or made seed specifically for certain guys that had a six-week uh, demand, you know, sort of flowering season. And, and and you know, they had to still bust open uh, some seeds, but they found the six-week or the five-and-a-half-week flowering one and they were done and, and they were in and out of their operation and uh, they're probably living happily ever after on some little island now and got nothing to do with marijuana. But we had a lot of unusual people in those days coming to Holland to buy, you know, huge volumes of seed and uh, they describe what they were looking to do and and I think I never heard of them. I never heard they got busted and I think that that's the successful ones when you don't hear about anybody, obviously. I love that. Myself, Ho hopefully. Successful, you know. <laughs> yeah, look, hopefully they're off on a Caribbean island somewhere living it up. As a quick follow-up, I guess I'd love to ask, Firstly, what's the most unique terpene profile, like weirdest thing you've ever smelled? And as a quick follow-up, those plants you just referenced, are they the quickest flowering you've ever heard of or have you heard of something quicker? Oh, no, they were They were uh, in some of the, I mean, I, I've heard people say that they've um, they found even quicker stuff, whether it's finished or whether it's mature. I don't know. I, I wasn't there, but... Uh, uh, I don't. I think a natural cycle is around, you know, sort of. Uh, you pretty much five to six, six weeks. I mean, you know, you can cut things earlier, but they're not. I don't think they're ready. And and I, I honestly think when you think it's ready, one week extra. You know, that's kind of always been a rule of thumb, because uh, a lot of um, um, a lot of the things that you you're not sure about. Um, happen in these last two or three weeks of flowering, and and there's some there's some stuff that still hasn't been exposed with uh, science that that we need to understand about that thing. Like whereas you can find out the alcohol levels and and all of the different things when it comes to grapes and the sugar content and uh, those sort of things. We we need a lot more of that in in sort of. Um, um, in people who have knowledge about uh, what they're breeding it for, what they're growing it for, what the production for, what the base products for, what you know, there's there's a multitude of things you can do now with this plant, and so I think having sometimes a pure 
sativa and a pure indica extract and blending them in different concentrations, you come up with some really interesting ideas and um, different flavours. And what you, you, one of the questions that you asked me was, what's the most unique one? Well, I mean, that, that's an exceptionally difficult um, question to answer because, um, like I said, Early Queen was very unusual compared to the fruitiness of skunks and the and the heavy berryness of the cushions and the and the the, the body odors or the oniony kind of flavors of the widows and and then maybe some mentholy alpines of the the hazes. You can have rough generalizations, but specific plants don't fit into those rough generalizations when you start to single them out. You single them out for some reasons to do with the olfactory system or or the effect or the one of the senses that it, it, it hit you with. And uh, and uh, up until um, like the CBD crew where science is helping us select, um, these were just all personal um, reasoning behind it and uh, personal likes and dislikes and that's why some structures uh, I can identify as Neville's plants from other people and uh, others I can identify as mine because he went for a kind of a different flowering cluster that looked more like balls that fit on top of each other where I, I had more individual flowers that were not like that structure. And so many times I see it, you know, that they've leaned towards those sort of things. I mean, you've got to face it, Neville was uh, out there. He was selling seed before most everybody commercially to many corners of the world. And I think a lot of that, um, you, you, you know, it's the Adam and Eve of, of, of the seed companies. It, it was a lot of things evolved out of that original stuff, you know, went to um, different corners, like I said. And, and you know, um, there's some excellent growers out there that took it on and, and ran with it. And um, we see a lot of those strains that now pop up every so often. Some people say they're created, but usually I think they've been created by excellent grower and hobby breeders who have been staying very quiet and don't commercialise their strain. Someone did it for them and, and, and some ego took it on, and you know, and, and I call it the seed circus nowadays because there's just, there's not a lot of uh, specific knowledge where certain things originated from. They, they're all more polyhybrid kind of things that, you started at that level and then you went on with it there. So, I mean, I mean, it's very difficult to, to do that, you know, um, to, to, to start with something that you've got no idea where the original parents, what they were, you, you might know theoretically, but you weren't, you don't have them or you didn't see them and, and what their parents were. And, and until you get back to a pure form, whether it was an Afghan or a Thai or a Mexican or, you know, where did it come from? And um, so I still prefer that kind of um, um, kind of knowledge about strains. So, yeah. of course, no, I love the passion, the F one hybrid magic, and also for keeping things pure, so you can do that. And I mean, while we're on that topic, I feel like there's a lot of variable terminology used in the cannabis industry. You know, lots of words get used which maybe aren't necessarily the correct word for that situation, and. Specifically, I'd be interested in knowing your thoughts on inbred lines. And I guess the question for me is, is it is it about reaching a certain number of back crosses or filial breeding? Or is it more just about getting it to the point where it expresses fairly true and that's like kind of independent of the, the number of generations? How do you think about it? Well, um, I can tell you that honestly, when, when I sold a seed or never sold a seed, um, no matter what we started from, after three, possibly four generations of someone doing it, taking that seed from us and going over to another corner of the world and then choosing his male and female and making his seed, after three or four, uh, four would be for sure. After four crosses and uh, using that seed, it is so far away from what originally sold even though you call it the same, let's say Northern Lights, because most people have got a completely different version of it. It might have started with Nev. He crossed uh, NL to 
to NL1 or NL, uh, and then he selected the NL5 from one of those combinations originally. There's a lot of stories, and I've got a lot of that original seed. And and as I said, there's male and female versions of of, of these things. So um, some people say that I mix it up many times. No, but I use the male version and the female version or the female version the male version to make it another line. Um I don't have the time and and um, to to go through every specific strain and, and that with their, every single person, but and explain why I do certain things. But but just generally, when you uh, when when you you start with um, things that have um, a name, and then you do three or four versions away, they're still the same name. People will still call it Northern Light, for example, but it won't be anything to do with what it originally looked like. Yeah, certainly. It is one of those things where it does it does change a lot. And it's almost like it taps into this secondary topic where sometimes you find more novice buyers will have this misconception that a certain strain in the F4 is inherently better than the F1 or the F2, you know, and you must deal with this a lot. Um, you don't know how much I deal with that. Um, it's really a lot. But I try to be patient with those things because um, not not everybody understands exactly what they're doing, you know. Um, many times when you make a selection, just again, let's say you, you bought a skunk one seed from us and the shit seed, I call it, and, and you, you, you pick a male and a female and you, you pick three and three and then you found your best female and your best male and you, you, you call it number one and, and number one. M for male, and and you, you you do your work, and you know everybody uh, loves what you're producing, and it comes out a particular way, and everything is, is sweet, you know, and, and you're known for that. Um, however, someone else has taken the same seed that bought it with you at the shop, and they've gone with their favourite male and their favourite female, and they've produced something that has got a lot more flavour, it's smaller bud. It's exactly the same name, same genotype, completely different phenotype, and you're both calling it the same thing. This is unfortunately um, the the very difficult thing to explain to everybody in this industry, especially newcomers, that that not everything with a generic name is from the same generational seed that, that they originated from. And why get so animated and argumentative about things or so passionate about things that you would never know even if they put it in front of you and you had a vision of it you wouldn't even know because you were not born and it was probably different to what the original version was and uh there's a selection for a, a, a making a production there's a selection for genetics to make seed sometimes i many times like i had a widow that was a a better producer for uh, a commercial people that wanted to use that dye, give them a cut of that. Whereas selling the seed, you know, you get a lot of differences coming up and, and some guys in Australia hitting it on the head and other guys in Canada not finding it and thinking it's a load of shit. So it, it, it really depends on the person's knowledge and and what they're looking for and, and if they know anything about the origins uh, and what they were and if they actually used it because what how I describe things when I write it down um, many people have just photocopied or, or cut and pasted and, and they that's used forever on every other company that I've seen you know I see how people are quite lazy they just take what's online and, and they think it is the gospel truth but you know, I still think that everything that you crack open or you select, you should do two or three times in a, a grow room before you really understand what you're talking about there and what flavours are there and how well it, it performs because it's easy to write a lot of bullshit and there's no one um, censoring this because we're still in a, in a pirate industry where we're allowed, we're not legal because making high THC uh, strains and growing flowers is still breaking the law of 0.3% THC so the seed's inside and that's legal once it's there but the flower is not so you know 
still to this day, every seed company is based on that, and uh, which makes them all illegal, actually, you know. Wow. There you go. There you go. I mean, there's not a legal seed company in the world uh, unless they're medically allowed uh, and licensed, you know, but all of the commercial companies, uh, the Dutch Fashion, the, the Sirius, the Greenhouse, the Mr. Nice, the everyone, we're all based on that principle. Don't get caught while you're producing seed and uh, because you're over 0.3% THC. There you go. Well, look, we're all very grateful that you do it for us. And uh, just as a quick change of topic, you know, I've been thinking a lot recently and I talked to lots of guests about how integral it is as like sort of a new or an up and coming breeder these days to be on social media. And I see you do a good job on social media, but I wanted to go back a bit. Back in the day, things like High Times and the like were kind of the social media in a sense, and they were a massive player compared to say what they are today. What was it like for you to have won a cup? Like, was like the mailbox exploding the next day with orders? Like, what sort of an effect did these guys have back in the day? They, uh, uh, I agree with you. Uh, the old social media were magazines. Um, their relevance has died away considerably there now there's a lot of online magazines uh, and you know they're sort of like online newspapers and stuff there they're read people still like to read about them. I, I write for uh, for this magazine actually i'm just writing an article at the moment dolce vita it's an italian magazine um and i have been for over 105 issues already you know it's so like 20 odd years i've been writing for them so I've written for Weed Work for every magazine, actually. And so I, I followed that. And, and you're right. Um, the day we won with White Widow, 95, um, and it was the second, uh, and we won also with the Greenhouse Seed Company as the, the first time we beat Sensi Seed and first time we entered, actually, as a seed company. Um, we had a post office box. That was, uh, we didn't have email. <laughs> it wasn't a drop like that. So at the post office box, it was 75018 or something in, in Amsterdam, was unbelievable amount of mail coming in every day. I was clearing it. It was like, I, I, I was like a, 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 fan, a, a celebrity or and everyone wanted the the widow, and then they wanted the rhino, and then they wanted the shark, and then they wanted super silver, and then they wanted you know La Nina, and it it, uh, it was a great time actually. I love the post, and there's something still seriously great about receiving physical mail um, with Christmas cards full of money, and and um, you know just asking please, and with a return address with Joe Smith on it. Um, I've seen everything, you know, people even sell, sending coins <laughs> from Poland. And oh, it's like, oh, you have to educate them. They really think that, that this is all, it was all very illegal and everything. But, you know, um, uh, it, it, the magazines made it look like that. And they were, we were, f the reason High Times went to Holland is because it was illegal in America. And the only place they could hold the cup was in a, Holland, so we we had you know fantastic seats for that game, and and <laughs> we we were there, and it was just purely because Holland was the first place that allowed the marijuana refugee to feel at home, and we were able to do these events there, and of course they were huge for us in those days. Uh, I don't think they're very important anymore. Um, I I actually don't advertise in. I, I work with one or two mag. I don't really do anything with magazines anymore. I think they lost their relevance. Um, I think um, um, they're still nice for people to to read sometimes when you're at a waiting room or something like that. But I don't think there there's nothing new going on in the industry uh, that quickly to allow so many different uh, uh, articles to do with uh, this particular plant. And uh, so I think they regurgitate a, a lot of the time um, old old stuff that hasn't really changed and the changes are incremental you know the for scientific changes so every time there's a big one everyone writes about it all but uh you know they had their relevance the 90s was fantastic uh, when i was with the greenhouse and 
we owe probably all of our success to the High Times magazine at that stage. Uh, then towards the end, it was a very corruptible kind of organisation as well and, and there was a lot of corruptible coffee shop owners and you know, we were also, you know, part of that whole thing and, and so I, I particularly didn't, yeah, my time had come to leave Holland around '98, and, and so I, I did a big thing with Neville that year, and then I left. That after that, I sold my shares and I, I left and uh, went to Switzerland. But um, uh, I did it mainly because I always wanted to be ph pharmaceutical. I always thought there was something much bigger than the coffee shop kind of mentality. And I still believe that to this day. And um, I've reached that point where I do sell um, a lot of medical items now that I've made from my selection of my individual plants that, and not in a synthetic way in a laboratory, how they're meant to be made for, you know, the, the pharmaceutical standard and regulatory body. Um, I still don't believe that the best people are, um, are sitting in the right areas uh, and making the right judgments um but unfortunately it's like you know who is the best person for that job you know and we're you know it's like policy it's like everything in the end you know money talk bullshit walks and in the uh, seems that the the people who have a lot of money somehow manage to uh, manipulate a little bit stronger than people who have less money yeah, isn't that the sad truth? But I, I guess if nothing else, it, it's awesome to hear that you got to experience that fantasy of, you know, the mailbox exploding with orders after that success. <laughs> I, I, I can tell you. I mean, it used to – I'd go on my bike down to the post office. It was a little bit out. It was near Olympic Stadium in Amsterdam. And it was a big one. And it was jam-packed. Many times they would – they knew me and they would come with other stuff because they couldn't fit it in the box. And sometimes I'd leave with bag and go home and it's a fan mail. It was fucking unbelievable. I mean, people used to send like embroidered uh, um, uh, t shirts uh, of our logo and, and they made it home because they were so inspired by growing that plant. Or, I mean, I had leather work, I had jewelry, I had, I mean, it was fucking it was fantastic. Before social media, before TV, before these mobile phone stupidity, but uh, now we use it all. And uh, I, I, I try to stay relevant, but I mean, I've got to tell you that most of the time the changes of uh, a lot of things come from my kids. Like at the moment, my son has been put in charge of changing the the logos and stuff, and and getting the shops working. He's much more better uh, on the. So let's say the framework of the the site, and uh, he's a younger guy. He's sixteen, seventeen, and uh, he listens and he learns and he educates himself. And uh, I've given him, put him in charge of uh, of that, and I think he's doing a really good job. Like my daughter, he runs the auctions and she talks to these unusual characters daily, and she seems to be so tolerant. I mean, she's doing her own thing as well. But you know, I, I'm really proud of that point of view i suppose that that um i came out of the black into the white and now it's a family business you know it's kind of very sweet that's so heartwarming to hear that it's now a family business i, I love that and i want to touch on the site after this but i want to quickly just ask first in the last answer you mentioned how popular the white widow was and i was hoping i could get a little bit of the backstory on that because i notice the majority of the sources online they say you're the creator but some of them reference this guy ingenmar i was wondering how does that guy tie into it and how did you make the seed line um ingmar was uh, uh was was growing he was working with us at, at that stage uh, right at that stage um and we he had selected some very good plants there was no doubt that he had some excellent stuff um i worked on making the seed of um selected material and so greenhouse was definitely the first company to make the seed version of the white widow however at that time he was growing 
shark. I mean, I can tell you this. Um, we were growing very similar plants. Shark, he called Peacemaker. Um, we called it Shark. Uh, there was probably one or two other plants that he, uh, with the same name, and they sometimes were first and second in some of these competitions. You know, they were they were the same plant. Uh, he was growing flowers. Aaron was buying flowers back from him. Uh, later on, I suppose they, uh, when I left, they, they started to make some seed. Um, they were very different, for sure. Um, I never shared the male that I had, um, and uh, the female was probably shared with Ingmar and probably two or three other growers at that stage who were growing commercially for the coffee shops. That version. Uh, and um, so, uh, of course, you know, and he had, uh, he, he wasn't a breeder. He was a flower producer. Um, his story was that he, he uh, when he was asked about it, he, he said he found it in a piece of hash, a, a seed. Um, I, I I gave the, where it came from, Corella, Brazil, and, and then what we did with it. And, and I actually, that's why I know that I'm, I was the first seed producer of white widow um and in holland there was a lot of claims of everything i mean i've met guys uh, still to this day have told me that um that they were the original creator of master push for example i said to them well i have master push scanning and uh and you know i i know that uh, who knows but what were the parents and they they would tell me hindu kush hindu kush and I'm going, yeah, well, I mean, that doesn't, I mean, that's fine. It shows me the area, the valley it comes from. But, you know, I mean, how, uh, and Neville was already working with so many people in the 80s were working with Afghan strains already privately in Australia and Canada and England, everywhere. Uh, you know, showing the goods, that was a different thing. And that's why I always say proof is in the seed. Bust open the seed and you'll understand if if they've done their work properly, if they haven't done their work properly. Um, and most people, unfortunately, because of the no regulations in the seed industry, uh, wouldn't know what their the original was because maybe they, they heard about it, they maybe seen a photo, but their version is different. You can give 10 growers the identical genetic and they get 10 versions back that look different. So you've got to really understand that there's no real story that is 100% correct. It's, I know my story, what I did, but uh, all the other hearsay was usually comes from people who, who were trying to um, sort of commercialise something or, or have a reason or angry or jealous. Or, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't care what people do. I changed my name from one widow to black widow. That was how much I, I wanted to uh, go away from the misrepresented version of what white widow was turning into and and um uh, so i i don't think many people copied me since then <laughs> they, they, there's a few but i mean uh, i won't mention them but i mean they critical mass is a perfect version you know it's a perfect version in 2000 uh in two, 1998 i brought it out first time it won uh plan of the year in spain 2000 2001 two, i don't know one of those years. and it just took off everyone used it and then there was critical mass so it's, it's in so many european companies uh, to this day um i still sell the original version you know so uh Probably a better a, a better example to tell you the truth because you know most people have it originated from Mr. Nice and and you know a, a lot of people um, are always claiming different things about um, different strains and stuff like that and um, to this day um, I never really saw people prove things you know so when the, the growers have bought their stuff and everyone would normally if it was authentic and real they would run over to it or maybe it was cheaper maybe that one brought it out uh, at a you know bulk rate and they giving a better deal and so people slowly um let's say tainted the 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 color of the water and and to know what is original or you know uh, it's difficult but usually you go back to where the seed was made to that company and asked to start there. That would be the most original version of who made it 
kind of famous in a seed version. And then that's why people come back to me. That's why people come back to Neville before he passed away. But now, I mean, I still have um, the Criticals, the Widows, the, the Hazes, a lot of the old stuff that people were looking for. And I kept them alive and I can only do that with original plants. And, and so, um, you know, there's a lot of stories that came out that people have gone and busted open thousands of seed in Africa or in South America. And I haven't seen anything that that um, helps the Africans. I haven't seen taking feminized seed to Africa and swapping it for some soil. It's not really helping anybody. I mean, it, you're tanking the crop and, and and you can claim a lot of things before before you've achieved them, like a lot of people do. It looks like they're helping the locals and that, but actually they're, they're helping themselves and, and they haven't really done anything that's contributed to, say, the gene bank of the world. I mean, there hasn't been anything special. They're taking, um, they're, they're commercialists and, and you know, some people believe it and, and go along and you get paid and, you know, other people know what they're doing and, and know where their origin started from. So, I mean, I, I, I think it's better if if for that as a, a purist that you start from the original story of 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 where that thing originated from because usually they had the parents to produce it you know yeah certainly and i mean the, the proof's in the pudding right and i guess as an extension of what you just said what was it like when you did that rebrand to mr nice seeds because i think on like a technical and a marketing level the name change was a brilliant business move but i also feel like it must have felt really daunting at the time like how would have you described it well it's hard to come from a number one company that have repeatedly for four five six years in a row been you know, outstanding had been the, the 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 new kids on the block had done all the right things, had got all the right new tools, got all the right new flavors, got all everything. And then, how do you how do you better that? You know what I mean. And I thought when I met Howard, um, I'd already started in the in '96. I met him, and then you know, I was still with the greenhouse and with Neville. He just moved over to us. He was just with a coffee shop, a share of not with the seed company, but we were. And I thought, you know, we were the the kind of the dream breeding team at that stage. Neville and myself, and then Ariane was the seller of all those things, and it was going well. We won all these things, and then I started thinking, you know, it was a little bit. Um, Corrupt the, the high times couple started to go a bit funny. And I thought, you know, um, Howard asked me about making a company. I went and spoke to Neville and I said, listen, mate, you haven't been involved with the seeds at, Mr. at Greenhouse. How about you contribute four and I put in eight and we start Mr. Nice like that. And, and um, I thought Howard was the best name in the industry, better than even Green, better than all of us in Holland. He was more, he was uh, a brilliant spokesperson and, and really a wonderful orator and an incredibly colourful character and a gentleman. And logically, there was nowhere for me to go higher than where I was than to Switzerland for medical with starting a new company with Howard and Neville. Uh, I owned the company. I just bought in things and gave them uh, um, share uh, some finances and stuff like that along the way as we built it up. But it was daunting, and I had to go down the hill before I went up the other hill because when you reach the top, there's only one one thing to do: either jump or <laughs> walk down. <laughs> and then uh, two things then. And I walked down the hill and started again. And uh, of course, you know, um, other people went on with the story. and, and um, But for me, integrity is everything. And, and actually, I didn't have really a problem because I, I know what I've got. And um, look, I wouldn't have been so successful. I wouldn't have um, made the critical masses and the CBD crew and, and done a lot of these innovations in the industry if I didn't have the goods and I didn't have the knowledge and I didn't have the support from the scientific community. So... Um, you, everyone can say what they want. They can say the stories what they want, or they they can claim things. But I mean, historically, you can see things that have happened and changed the industry. And I've usually been the vanguard there. You know, I've, I've been there. 
Yeah, certainly. I mean, that's what I meant in the intro. One of the the grandfather's pillars of the scene. It's it's been consistent, which is incredible. And you mentioned the critical mass a few times. I wanted to ask you because it is such a staple, especially in the European scene. It's these you know critical mass feminized seeds cross to most hybrids these days. Yeah. How did you make that one? Was it just line bred from some big bud seeds? What was the process of developing it? Oh, I, got, I actually selected uh, a different different male um, and, and hit it with the original big bud. I mean, Neville's big bud uh, to uh, a, a different male that I'd selected. And um, it was a reworked skunk, actually, to the truth, a super skunk. And so it, it was made to to be, you know, sort of a huge flower, like like your fore, like a forearm of a boxer. It was compact, fragrant. The effect was incredibly you know, narcotic. Everything that a, a grower, a commercial grower, wanted to do there it was a new work, big bud. And we called it critical mass, and it just took off. I mean, uh, uh, and still to this day, it's everywhere. Um, I would say that a lot of people use it in strains. They probably don't even know what it is, but it, it grows like a sativa and it flowers like an indica, and that's the the particular um, look about it. Many people are a bit worried that I've given them the wrong plant because the long leaf that's coming. But it's an excellent, excellent plant, uh, and still to this day, it's an incredibly good tool for people who are trying to bring in weight to their, their crops and, and strength. So, you know, you don't have things like that. I mean, that was uniquely Mr. Knight. That was, forget about all the stories of widows, of super silvers, whatever you want. That was uniquely set up by Mr. Nice. And then after that, a lot of the Mr. Nice strains were used in CBD crew and that went on and all of them were selling it under different names until I made their seeds with their two varieties. So, you know, I, that's why I keep saying that I, I'm not trying to be egotistical and that I know what I did and and I know and they know what they did with me and so we kind of the honest truth is is one thing and, and maybe the brochures are other things I don't know you know no of, of course we we trust your word which is you know we're really grateful to have you here and we've been talking about all these legendary strains you've made and we finally need to chat about your new site that's in the works you mentioned your son's helping to build it what sort of things can people expect will there be a store there where they can grab your seeds and will the auctions continue the shantybubbaseeds.com is that, was that yes the new store yeah um, yeah, we got a project. Um, so what, what I was speaking to the kids about was that that I, I've made a lot of um, – Mr. Nice is, it has got a shop and it will stay how it is at this moment in time. Um, as a regular seed company, um, the integrity is impeccable. We, we won't um, – we won't be uh, compromising that in any way. So, but Shanti Baba Seeds, it, it, we've, I've got a lot of projects going on and I just thought I've got a lot. Sometimes um, I usually keep back a bunch of seed of each project in case something goes wrong and I can test it myself from what people see. And, and then it sits in the fridge when everything goes right, uh, we go on with it and, we're, and that seed's just sat there. So the auctions came about originally. Um, but now... Um, my son was talking to me. He said, "Dad, you know, we we seem to have quite a, a lot of different things that n no one knows about. You know, the, it's like the project stuff." And I said, "Yeah, but I mean, just give it away to people who are less fortunate, or people who come and ask me for help, or something." And I send them batches of seed. But he said, "Yeah, we've got enough to fucking feed the army." Excuse me. To uh, um, you know, and and maybe we should just release it uh, under a different project seed. So it's a limited editions that they're, we've made them and they're finished and that's a, lot, a deadline and, and if you want to continue it on and you want some work and there's always people looking for projects and, and so up until then I've been offering it in uh, some some seeds with uh, with the auctions with Sarah and my daughter. She's been doing all of that. But I thought, you know, um, Dakota had made sense and, and um, he's coming back in the Easter time and we're going to start to separate some of these batches. And I'll, I'll give the dates when we made them and that so people know that. But we'll probably offer a lot of those things, some bulk, you know, 100 pack, uh, like uh, older seed where the germinations are down. But uh, there's definitely some interesting genetic to be found. Um, 
I don't sell uh, feminizer or the farm, but I will, and the Shanti Baba seeds because I've made so many for different people. Um, I'm not making an opinion about it. Um, um, just um, make available whatever seed that we're not using and we're not keeping for backup um, to other people if they want to, you know, try it. I did a project, like I told you, with Grounded Genetics uh, uh, with their tsunami plant and five of my thing, and I've now offered that out to different growers, just sent it out this week, and, and so that's on the Mr. Nice thing, but it's a Shanti Bubba project. So when we get the website up and everything done, uh, we'll probably, you know, still continue to use the Mr. Nice forum to discuss Shanti Bubba seeds and stuff. But it will probably just be a little bit of other things that, that have been um, working on over the years, you know. Wow, that's really exciting. I'm sure everyone listening to this has ears have perked up and they're keen to check it out. Out of curiosity, are there any, like, names that come to mind of strains that might be offered just to give people an idea of some of the oh, things yeah. they I might mean, see? you know, we, 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 um, the original hash plant, um, garlic bud, um, heavy-duty fruity nug, um, some projects that I've done, you know, some uh, some original uh, pushes, some very old uh, Mexican, uh, let's just say the preludes to a lot of skunks that were Mexican, Colombian and um, Afghan um, in them. Um, uh, Ortegas. Uh, um, Howard, uh, Howard, not Howard, um, Neville, big pardon, had a lot of different um, numbered Ortega plants, and, and we've, I've busted open a lot, you know. I think someone criticised me for mixing up the things last time about Ortega, but there, Neville had everything, Ortega, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, crossed with Ortega, one, two, three, four, and so... Um, the seed, I was just trying to uh, copy what he's busting open and, and what we're, we're collecting and, and where it came from originally. So I'm documenting everything. I mean, I, I, I keep it as honest and truthful as where it comes from and, and where, where the source was. But, you know, I've got so many different things. Uh, like uh, I've got this Zamal, which we've been, we worked on quite a lot and, and then we stopped because I just didn't have any room anymore. It's a big plant, you know, it's a fruit. So I mean, there's so many color colors in, you know, in the rainbow. Um, I really have don't have a plan at the moment, um, Daisy. I'm uh, really basically thinking that you know my son is going to probably direct traffic in that one. But but I've got r medical rooms opening up for May this in Switzerland, so I'm getting gearing up for uh, busting open some really old, really old stuff, eighties and you know some 90 stuff and and just see if we can uh find some really interesting kind of phenos and 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 differences rather than all of these bush skunk mixtures that are polyhybriding at the moment and uh feel like lollipops sometimes you know what i mean there is too many uh <laughs> it's, it's more to the turpin and the high cannabis, you know, the high THC, and, and rather than the whole plant, um, kind of natural whole plant that that happened, uh, when it combined with different sort of origins, you know. Um, so I think you know, I'm just kind of looking for some old, old school stuff again, you know. Wow, incredibly exciting! I'm sure some jaws hit the ground when they heard that, like, you know, maybe you get some garlic bud or some Ortega. I could never really find good info. Is that one, like, does it come from Jim Ortega or is it, like, in honour of him in the way, like, the Jack Harris strain is? And how would you describe those plants? Well, uh, uh, Neville. Neville, um, it originally came from um, Neville's. In, um, he was handed some stuff, Jim Ortega. I don't know whether I wasn't there again. Uh, he told me a lot of things, but uh, I busted open the seed that he, he left me with and... Um, there's definitely, you know, a lot of um, heavy Afghan influence in this line. Okay, it's a really for me, uh, it's it, 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 it's solidly coming to a, probably an area in that was a, a, like a family legacy line that was growing in Afghan for many years. 
Uh, I don't know if Jim Ortega or, or Neville um, um, doctored up the story or whatever, but, you know, when I bust open some of those old stuff, I can see that there's some really heavy-hitting kind of uh, indica-based plan. And I've never really been one for that, but, I mean, it's time to to sort of release the, the Kraken and let it all open up and, and see if we uh, if we can find something interesting. I mean, I'm I, I I've been in it too long to to promise anything to anyone anymore because you never know where you're going. That's the thing. So you you bust it open and you you're on for the ride, you know, and it, it can really surprise you. Um, it can sometimes disappoint you, and other times you're elated with the eureka moments. But uh, you know, uh, that's the beautiful adventure of busting open seed. That's it. You know, one of my favorite quotes, every seed is like a prayer. I love it. It's uh, it's it's interesting the journey it'll take you on. And you must have been reading my mind because you've preempted this next question perfectly with the best caveat ever. But it's actually a fan submitted question from one of our listeners. And they said, I really want to grow out some Mr. Nice seeds. I'm wondering how many packs does Shanty recommend I pop in order to hopefully find something special? Normally, I... I, I it, I say a, a sample, a, a small sample, is usually a hundred seeds. Five pack. We we sell. We say we sell fifteen per pack. We put eighteen in. Give the grower a little bit heads up and and help in case something doesn't work for them. And we've always done that. But you know, four or five packs of a strain is probably the best way to go um, with with. Uh, if you want to give it a fair thing, I understand if you can't do that, you maybe, you know, minimum would be 20. You can't do it with two or three, not regular seeds. You mind if I hit my, I'm going to hit my vapor. I've got a new vaporizer. I'll just show you. I can, oh, cool. That looks nifty. Oh, wow. It's got your logo on it. And it, what it does is uh, it keeps the cartridge in the battery at the bottom and it has different, uh, different, modes you can do it on so we'll be that, that'll be in the shop soon as well i was gonna say okay cool so people can look forward to these nice vapes yeah 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 it's a fantastic vape i really i've been looking around for them i usually use the c cell stuff that uh when i was driving i just wanted it but this one's just a bit more powerful and um now some of the the thc uh mixtures that we're using which are much thicker um, this is better for uh, it's got different uh, heat um, uh, um, on the coil, different heat settings on the coil, and so um, yeah, it actually works really well for some of the, the thick THC stuff. You know, I'd love to quickly ask: Do you feel the future is in these sort of really convenient portable pen style vapes? Um, well, you know, it's a bit like analog digital. Um, I think. I think a lot of people will still like to roll joints to this day. Um, a lot of recreational, the ritual of joint rolling still is uh, is a, a big factor for some people. And um, uh, I think vapes make sense for yeah, medical people who really don't want to consume combustibles, and but they want a quick hit and they want to, you know, the volcano is, was one of the wonderful things. It was developed, but not everyone can carry around a volcano with a big bag attached. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, I, I think um, what we what we what can find is that there will be a a certain section of the market. Let's say you know, sort of. I think it's going to rise because people want clean, um, non-contaminated, non-heavy metal, non-pesticide, non insecticide material and that's coming in these distillates that we're making now because we have very heavy um, um, sort of rules for those things to be made under GMP basically and, and um, they're very clean um, if they're not sort of pirated and um, and we've got all the paperwork so if for me it, it's definitely a medical tool um and i think it's very convenient for those who are driving long distance that don't, don't want to roll a joint don't want to stick out the car 
but they need a quick hit and that just you know back pain or something i mean for me what we what i advise is that, like we make a, a a pill basically there's thc and cbd in it and that's uh, uh, for the long haul and then the vape is for when it's starting to fade you hit it up for another hour or so and we we use that and so we kind of prescribe that to people who are in the medical fraternity over here and that's how, how we use it um so i suppose that it will be continually growing until you reach a, a level in the market in australia that is maybe you know i don't know 300,000 at the moment maybe a million people sign up to be medical users over the next few years you'll reach a, a level and maybe you'll see 20 30 percent of the market is doing vapes and that will probably be the medical ones still the ones doing the pills or the the oils then you've got a large section of let's say um free thinking people who use it for both and uh, maybe uh, then there's going to be uh, the black market's going to be fed by the white market eventually because it's going cheaper than black market in Australia. And so eventually those things will happen naturally as well. I mean, you can't help them. Uh, it's just logic for people who are in different situations, you know. And so I suppose, I mean, you know, I, I'm just trying to call it how I see it. But, I mean, it's probably something like that, I would say. Yeah. On a slightly unrelated note, I wanted to ask, citrus terpenes are really popular in modern cannabis, your mandarin and orange flavors. And Lemons. Yeah, and I noticed that there isn't really a ton of citrus in your genetic lineup on face value. Is this because you're not particularly into that? Is it just coincidence? How do you feel about orange and citrus? I think um, when you bust open a few things, you get the citrusy stuff. I mean... The mango and, and the super silver haze, there's definitely uh, things that go towards that. Um, I used to have, uh, uh, and, and actually that was one of the other ones, the original orange bud, um, which was really orange. I mean, what we were selling in the coffee shops in the early 90s, um, the Californian orange was one of those first skunks that really combined its flavour specifically to that line of turpins and and uh and then there were some that deviated a little bit and were a bit more lemony and and sort of mandarin -y and and you know i i suppose that the berries and and the you know they all sort of slightly there it just depends on the selection of plants but um i kind of think that i've got a lot of them in my plants already it's just that i don't have uh specifically targeted that that line of turpins but i believe that um in 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 my 40 odd strains that that you can find specific things there but you know it depends i, I try to keep it open like i explained to you before 70 percent similar 15 to each side of the parents that kind of what i consider stable genetics and and that allows hobby hobby guy growers to to go to that 15 percent either side and find things to do more pure form and to work on so you know i mean i'm passing the the baton at, at most of the time nowadays and i'm starting to think that there's some really good guys out there that that need just a hand with some old genetic tools and and i still got them in the in the arsenal so uh pass them out you know that's, that's beautiful to hear. And I, I've certainly heard more recently a lot of the more sort of newer modern breeders referencing that they're actually really keen and specifically throw your name out there as stock they want to run through. And I have to admit, a uh, bit of an oversight in my last question, I, I have a Super Silver Haze hybrid that is very citrusy. So I want to correct the record. I was I was not good in the phrasing of that one. So kudos to you. Yeah, no, that's it's the truth though. There, there are a lot of... Uh sort of strains that i don't really write it down i prefer you to find what you're liking and yeah i mean i heard that many times from from those strains uh, that there's a lot of those things available there so yeah certainly and, and it segues nicely into the next question which is like you've worked with this same really solid base of genetics for the longest time and i know in the last episode 
you mentioned that for the most part, you're not particularly interested in some of the more new stuff. I'd love to know, do you ever see yourself maybe incorporating a little more modern or new stuff into the arsenal? Their project with Grounded Genetics is using one of their, uh, I think it, it, it arrived from Skittles and um, your scout cook. I can't, I'm, maybe I'm wrong, but I know that he's working with that, the, all the new stuff. He's a young guy, uh, like him a lot, and uh, he's very open and honest and he's very fanatical about um, um, his, his sort of ideas in his head and, and he, he goes for them. And uh, I, I was hoping to find something. Um, we sell a lot of seeds to Morocco, you know, a lot of bulk seeds, and and they're they're looking specifically for hash strains that are really good that are producing large amounts of resin. And so I think in this tsunami, I think the Northern Light Five Haze uh, with the tsunami, or the Black Widow with the tsunami, might be really interesting hash varieties. Uh, also, there's a G13 with the tsunami, which uh, I think uh, he's already grown indoors and, and with the seed and uh, look toxic. So, uh, you know, I think um, um, it will be really interesting either way. And we'll, we, you usually see the year after we've made the seed, some people have bought it, put it out, and then that pollen comes back to Europe and you, you, you get the name if it's, uh, if it's knocking people out. And, <laughs> you know, it's kind of... Or if it's some sort of extreme flavor or something like that, you know. So um, yeah, I mean, we, we work with all different types of characters and and uh, try to take them all seriously. Yeah, wow, that's so interesting. I guess in a in a long winded sense, you get to reap the fruit of your labor when you say when the hash comes back. Out of, out of curiosity, is that you just have like a, a contact who you just offload seeds to and they distribute it locally or is it just to like a big farm? Uh, yeah, we've got uh, there's the, – let's just say um, – how would I best describe this without hurting any? Well, there's a few people who uh, um, who have been working in, in Morocco for many years, for example, uh, a lot of Spanish, Dutch, English people and um, a lot of them – have blocks of land now and they come and purchase you know a few hundred thousand seeds at a time of you know four or five different strains and then they go over and then the year later you come they come back with a, a lot of the uh um, pollen already semi-pressed or pressed and and goes on the market commercial market is the moroccan hashes and uh you know you see uh you see this year i saw pineapple skunk and different all these different things that we've been you know, sort of making for different people and, and it comes back as pollen and, and some of it's fantastic, you know, there's nothing nothing wrong. It's it's again like the wine maker, the hash maker, it depends on the hash maker and how clean they are and what what press it is, what pass it is. If it's the first pass, you know, you can see it's really grey and incredible ash and uh, then it gets down to the green stuff, which is, you know, like uh, the old French papers or or different versions of just commercial quality stuff, you know, probably second, third or fourth pre pass, you know. So, um, yeah, when it gets too green, I start to go the other direction usually. <laughs> yeah, sure. That that's so interesting to hear. There you go. I would have I would have never known. Well. We're kind of on the tail end of it. We've got a few fan-submitted questions I'd love to run by you, but the first one I want to quickly ask before we jump into them is, a bit earlier on, we were talking about the challenges in maintaining a library over the long term, and I wanted to ask you, there's a common topic discussed in the community about sort of the loss of vigor, or maybe you'd call it like genetic deterioration. There's various terms used. Have you seen this? Do you think that plants deteriorate over time? And would you say that it's genetic drift or just some alternative sort of deterioration? No, I mean, that's. Uh, I think that's a lot of bullshit, to tell you the truth. Uh, I think if you're preserving plants in a very good environment and uh, specifically we grow, we take our old mothers outside after nine months and we grow them for one or two months outside and take a new cutting, a new cutting from the new growth, and bring it in for the next season. And we've been doing that for some plants that are uh, like 30 odd years old. So uh, I didn't see any deterioration, I don't see anything. The only thing that I see nowadays is a lot more people passing different things to different people and viruses are now becoming, impacting the industry. Um, and uh, the cleanliness, and, and that's why I don't 
bring in any plants in my greenhouse in America or in Europe from anywhere else. We do all of our mothers and all of our clones are done in the facility for the production. Only dry flower go out or seeds go out from that. We already cleaned, have cleaned uh, science, uh, laboratory uh, controlled uh, testing. And uh, if anything, uh, like just recently, there was uh, a pink lemonade clone found in, in one particular room uh, in Switzerland that was growing. And, and it looked like it had the virus. So I had my... My uh, the CEO of the company I work with now, uh, Berg Gluten in Switzerland. Um, I went over, he went there straight away, took a sample, and then we took a sample from our m mother room. And then I took a sample from another mother room that I have specially away from those ones. Two of them were infected, don't know how they got infected, and one of them was not at all. So we killed everything. I've got all of them backed up in the tissue culture, but the thing is that it's going to take nine months to grow out before we can get it back. So um, the the last one, which is closer to me, that was clean, and I and I was able to take a cutting from that and bring it back into the new uh, into the old area when they cleaned out everything and sprayed it all down. And and you know it was not it was maybe from scissors it might have been from someone touching something it could have been brought in from other rooms to that room because there's a lot of traffic there unfortunately and you know that's why I say this um, I'm not trying to frighten anyone I'm just trying to say you know work clean uh, dip with alcohol um, wash your hands use gloves uh, when you're working with mothers and clones. Just that area, if for me, is the most important. If you keep that solid, if you grow out mothers each year outside in the sunlight, bring them in, you, those sort of precautionary things, you will never have issues to deal with with uh, genetic drift and this so-called genetic drift anyway. it's they, they, they treat it like a photocopy of a photocopy of a photocopy. I don't believe that because every year I reset it outside and I bring it in and it's more fit than it was the nine months before. Indoor light um, will eventually, it's not natural, um, anything growing not naturally uh, for, for too long will start to have some um, changes uh, taking place and, and, and possibly uh, they're not as healthy. There might not be. There might be some animal issues that have gone on thing, and then all of a sudden you start to see this plant not performing very well anymore. And, and it's not genetic drift. It's just unhealthy, non-fit uh, mothers. You know. Yeah, certainly. And look, that's reassuring to hear that you can sort of reinvigorate them by giving them that that uh, that season outside that the sun is revitalizing like that, and. Building on what you've said, you know, you've expressed a pretty clear concern about the hoplaten virus and it does feel a bit out of sight, out of mind, which is a bit concerning. Do you have concerns that like a new virus will emerge or do you think that the hoplaten is the one to be concerned about and it's just going to persist? I think there are, uh, I'm a biologist, a plant biologist in, 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 in if you wanted to label it in the end and, and, of course, monoculture breeds new viruses, unfortunately, and, and we're monoculturing uh, really intensely at the moment, like anything that the um, everyone thinks uh, is raining money. You know, all of a sudden you get the big guns come in, set up the big greenhouses, and, and they don't really – they're not passionate about the plant. They're just looking for the, the business. And, and um, yes, with those sort of – uh, operations, we're going to see a lot more um, viruses coming in. The beet jelly, there's a, there's a really a couple of weird viruses already, very minutely affecting things. I keep an eye on everything, um, and you know, there's one that, that that makes the plant kind of look like a a cousin it at the top of the plant. Uh, I forgot the name. I think beet virus or something this uh, it's a, a, it looks very unusual you realize that's distinctly uh, bacterial 
issues and uh i don't know i mean you know if you rob ha rob rob clark made a book hemp and he he went, covered a lot of viruses in that uh that had already been established in hemp for many years already and they're going to jump and they're going to change uh people uh networking and crossing over and passing plants i mean that's for me it, it, it's natural we have viruses living in 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 the atmosphere and and around us but uh i think if you want to keep your room clean um and devoid of that sort of stuff then have a quarantine if you're going to bring in plants into a certain area quarantine them in a in another tent first for a few weeks make sure or, or do a flowering make sure that everything's clean and you're using clean tools before you let them come into the main room so we we do a lot of that protocol nowadays with everything and and i don't allow people who don't need to be there to be there it used to take you know a lot of people around and show them around and everything like that but now it was to our detriment in the end and and you know some so basically we're closed shop now and i i don't really come out in public. I don't do the show so much anymore. I don't do any of that. But, I mean, I'm still available online and I'm very easy to talk to with uh, if you're a grower and, and um, I, I, I love to be involved with the kids, helping them and, and they're helping me and, and it's kind of, I find it in a really good stage at the moment of, of life of where uh, the next generation is, uh, I don't say that they're going to be always interested, but at the moment they they uh, they need some financial independence, and so I've got them on a, a, a carrot at the moment, and and hopefully they they do they bring to the table stuff that I've got no idea about, which is pretty evident they are, and so we're we're a pretty good team at the moment. I really like that. Wow. Yeah. Look, understandable that you have to tighten the belt with the quarantine given the viruses and. Gosh, if only we could all be so lucky to have a father like yourself dangling such an incredible carrot. That's uh, that's awesome to hear. I mean, you're a sweet guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, you mentioned the next generation. I wanted to ask you because I know you work with some big facilities. The new generation of lighting, are you sold on LEDs? Do you prefer the old school HPS metal halide? Well, I'm not sold on anything that doesn't prove itself. I um I use a lot of LEDs in the mother rooms. Um, with a, I've gone back to combination. Um, so in my mother rooms, I still use some um, Sante uh, Philips uh, um, high pressure sodium uh, interspersed with a lot of LEDs and stuff. So I've got a blend of of uh, spectrum there. Um, the mothers are, are respond well. They're good. The clones, um, LEDs, fine. And the, I use the LEDs in the clone. I used to use tube light, uh, you know, fluorescence, and and uh, I've always very soft, cool, cool white, you know, kind of um, tubes. Um, so I've gone on everything, but um, you know, uh, in big greenhouse in America, we're basically not on LEDs at all. We're only we just changed all the globes. We're on uh, six hundred waters, um, and we're producing uh, huge amounts on living soil and and excellent quality. So uh, you know, I'm open to everything. Uh, it, it's whatever. What uh, I'm not a guy that that is the first on the block to to get new technology. I like to see it proven. I might be the first on the block to to try out new new breeds and things like that and, and and you sort of dabble in in making keeping males alive there's no value for people keeping males alive most of the time and i'm driving males from five different countries to all that you know i mean my and there's no value for anybody you know i have to pay them to keep them there and and growing and so yeah my jobs uh vary depending on what jumper i'm wearing that day and you know now we make flowers for for certain companies and in Europe and in Australia and, and kind of, you know, now we're, we're trying to spread our wings a little bit. And while the, the market is still emerging in Europe, the, the legal medical market is still not uh, tight and, and with a dis distinct direction in Europe. And 
and as it's not as developed as in Australia or America or Canada at the moment. And and so we're we're just getting aligned for that time. I think it's coming this year. I, I believe very strongly that France and Germany will will um, will be at the forefront of those things. And you know, some other countries, Italy, Spain, and Greece, maybe they're they're lingering behind, watching. You know, Europe's not one country. It might sound like it's a, a conglomerate, but it's still they've still got different uh, cultural differences, you know, and and there there's definitely um, some differences in in the stigmas, <laughs> unfortunately. And and but um, in Switzerland, we're great. I mean, I I really appreciate the Swiss for for that reason that they actually are allowing a lot of stuff to happen, take place indoor facilities in certain things. They know what we're doing. We have to announce it and we have to try to describe it as best we can before we've done it. Then they come along and check and, you know, they 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 do what they say and we do what we say. And as long as that's all going along, pretty okay. Our, uh, our last question for this interview, I've been waiting to ask you, what in your opinion is some of the best genetic stock you've ever worked with? Well, I suppose... Um, if I have to think about it over all my career, okay, uh, I was probably the most excited of my life when I came across, uh, when I we started to develop something from Main Arm in Australia many years ago when I was at university. We called it Mullumbimbi Madness, but there was a lot of diff- – I, I think we talked about this last time. I just remember – Growing this from seed with with Rob, the, one of the guys, that, the main grower, and, and smuggling it down in pillows, you know, someone in the pillows and down at Melbourne University and it goes in a matter of hours, you know, it was like, it was, um, it never disappointed. It was one of these strains that, it's like Neville's Honey, it, 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 it was very similar. I, I still see no matter what anyone says, uh, how you use the name Hayes or Malamimi or whatever, it was an early development of of, of definitely Colombian Thai things in that that time, you know. And uh, I, uh, we used to grow it year after year from seed, and and it was it never disappointed. It was an exciting thing. And then I came across it when I bumped into Neville in Europe many years later in the 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 Hayes version so I, that's why i always called it an australian Hayes. but uh i can't prove that it came from completely different sources i think but it might not have the origins originally the countries it came from it might have been very similar we weren't there and so uh you know like i i say to you many times mate that uh we're the hands of nature at best and we get things from the last generation and they got things from the generation before and hopefully we improve on it and and we don't sort of uh you know sort of diverse uh, um um, deviate sorry from from the the good direction and and just make it commercial we we kind of continue there's a certain amount of breeders that do a really good cottage industry job with certain strains and they don't need to do 50 strain they need to do two or one and they do that incredibly well, and uh, they should be uh, acknowledged for that as well. I mean, there's a lot of really fantastic growers uh, out there that have been keeping things alive for a lot, a lot of years. And um, it's just timing of my life it was probably I was in a lucky situation, you know. And, and I had all the guys around me. I didn't know they were the guys at that time. You know, we we're just normal guys smoking a joint, and drinking a glass of wine or something. You know, in Amsterdam. Wow, in- incredible. I'm, I'm so stoked to hear again how special the Mullumbimby Madness was to you and the similarities with Neville Hayes. I think that just about brings us to the end of it for this one. Any comments or shout outs you want to make? No, I just appreciate you taking the time to uh, delve into some of these uh, things and I hope uh, I, I stimulate uh, your, your, um, your viewers uh, into and if they ever want to ask questions they, they're more than welcome to come to the website and and, uh, and, and talk directly there um, I'm pretty approachable I don't I treat everyone as equal so we uh, and boys and girls every 
type of whatever and we're all fine with that you know we're in an industry which is trying there's still some people in there trying to maintain a good integrity and try to do the right job and and i think we're linking up with a lot of them so i still think that there's um as much as the cops are negative um feedback from even people within the industry i think there's a lot of Great people, and I'm hoping the direction that takes will be the right one eventually, and uh, will be there for the right reasons. You know, absolutely. I highly encourage everyone to go check out the forum. Go have a chat to Shanti himself. A massive, massive thank you again, a titan of the industry, Shanti Barber of Mister Nice Seed Bank. Thanks for chatting to us today. Look forward to the next one. So there you have it, friends. Thank you so much for making it to the end. And a big thank you to Shanti Barber for coming back a second time. Share some incredible and inspiring words. If you love this episode, please consider supporting both the Patreon as well as Mr. Nice Seeds. Check out the new website, shantibarberseeds.com, as well as the websites of our incredible sponsors. If you're looking to transition from combustion to vaping, check out our good friends at Dynavap. You will not be disappointed. Cheap, affordable, and incredibly efficient units. Likewise, check out our friends at Pulse Sensors if you want to make sure that your garden is dialed in and you are tracking all of the variables that are going to ensure your next harvest is the best to date. You've got to get yourself a Pulse, guys. It's a no-brainer. In order to ensure that your garden is pest and pathogen free, please check out our friends at Copet. They are the number one in biopredatory technology. The Spidex Vital sachets have been a game changer. The slow release of Spidex Vital will make sure that your garden is spider mite free. Copet, thank you so, so, so much for your support. Likewise, a big shout out to our friends at Organics Alive for all the most incredible powdered organic products usable in all systems, both organic and hybrid. People winning cups around the globe with their products, it's no surprise because the quality is second to none. A huge thank you to Organics Alive. We recommend them highly. Please check them out if you want to take your organic game to the next level. Finally, massive shout out to our good friends at Seeds here now. They've got Heavy Days Beans. Go check them out, guys. I promise you will not be disappointed. They've got all the latest drops, the hottest breeders, Fem, Auto, Photo Period, CBD, whatever you need, they're here to help you out. A massive thank you to our friends at Seeds here now. And big love to the Patreon gang. We love you so much. Thank you for supporting the show. They got early access to this episode over a month ago. If you want to get extra content, please consider supporting the show. You score yourself genetics, a whole bunch of swag from our sponsors, and so much more. So that just about brings us to the end of it for this one. A big thank you to you for getting to the end yet again and for the support. Big love as always from your boy Heavy Days. Signing off. See you.